Good evening, everybody. Welcome to iFocus Online Lecture 203 and Retina Session 55. Today, we have Dr. Dinesh Talwar speaking to us on pragmatinous retinal detachment, causes, examination, rules to break, and differential diagnosis. I invite Dr. Lalit Varma to introduce Dr. Dinesh to us. Thanks, Deepti. Uh, uh, Dinesh Talwar, we call him DT with love. It's so close, so close that uh, uh, difficult to introduce because such a close friend for more than three decades, exactly if I say it, it must be 37 years. We have been uh, you know, together day in and day out. And uh, what I should say about DT is he's a very, very keen observer. More important than that is a very astute and a passionate clinician. You see, by passionate clinician, I mean that he's so much concerned about his patients that uh, I've seen him, you know, going home, then coming back to see again his patient. And every day, next day, he will come and, you know, whether it's a holiday or holy day or Diwali day, post-op day, he has to come. He has to come himself. He will not, uh, you know, depend on others, even though whatever. He's a very, very passionate, concerned always for the patient and goes into nitty-gritty of each and every finding and depth of it. Concepts, his concepts, so you see, are very, very clear, very, very clear. And that's why, you so he has, he, he, he is a great, great teacher. In fact, the way he answers his questions for the patients is, uh, is a learning exercise for everybody. And the amount of time he spends with the patients. And he's a great listener also. And believe me, some of the webinars and, uh, you know, and workshops uh, and retina meetings, which we do, are never complete without DT being there. Such is the intensity of discussions he holds and such is the respect he has in the, in the uh, vitreatna field in the country. Not in the country, even in the, you know, a lot of uh, abroad, uh, uh, you know, webinars which I have attended with him, such is the respect which he enjoys amongst the retina community. Because uh, the level of clarity he will seek from that uh, webinar, or he will bring into that subject, will be so clear that, uh, that that is the reason I think everybody respects. Above all, believe me, he is a great, great uh, human. And that is the reason he is the greatest friend I have had uh, in the uh, entire ophthalmic career of mine. I'll not go into, you know, what he has done. He is a alumnus of AIMS. We have been, we'll just show the slide. Uh, is, uh, he has been... Uh, you know, with me since uh, Ames days, uh, he's a graduate, postgraduate of Ames, and uh, and uh, he has you know number of research projects which he has guided uh, students. Very passionate about them. I did a couple of books, and very important way back. You see, around say so many uh, seventeen years back, he won at very young age P. Shiver duration by AIUS, and a couple of more achievements which are there has been listed here. But as I said. A great clinician, very passionate teacher, very passionate clinician, and a great human being and a very, very great friend. So today he's going to cover the subject which, uh, you know, he has been handling for uh, so many decades, rheumatic retinal detachment, how to approach a patient, what should you think when you see a diagnosed patient attachment, and maybe differential diagnosis, and so many things I think he'll cover, uh, principles of surgery, Linkoff's rule, I know. He will go into great depth of it. Diti, you have uh, nearly 45, 50 minutes. And what to talk, because he is our own alumnus. He is alumnus of CFS only. So without wasting much time, over to you, Diti, for a great talk all of us are expecting from you. Thank you very much, Lalit. And that, I mean, I, it can't be a more uh, better uh, introduction than this. And um, very, very flattering. Um, Thank you very much. I'll now start with the screen Yeah, sharing. yeah, we can start sharing it. Yeah, screen, we can see, you can maximize it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, Great. basically, we'll be discussing various aspects of retinal detachment. 
And before we come to that, the first thing is what is a retinal detachment? The retinal detachment is the separation of the inner nine layers of the retina from the 10th layer, which is the retinal pigment epithelium. Now, why does that occur? Why the ninth layer from nine layers from the 10th? Why not any other level? Now, this happens because the formation of the outer RPE occurs from the outer layer of the optical vesicle and the inner nine layers from the invagination of the wall of the optical vesicle during development. And that leads, leaves a potential space between. What you see here is an optical, an OCT showing a, a, a detachment. And on the other side, the arrow shows an attached retina. So what keeps these layers together? No, there are no, there are no junctions there. There are no bridges there. There's nothing holding them together. So what is holding them together? Well, there are anatomical factors in as much as the retina and RPE itself, you know, they don't let water pass through. So they provide a substantial resistance to water movement. So this is one uh, factor which prevents, uh, which uh, prevents the retina from detaching. The second thing is that an intact vitreous gel that plugs a retinal hole and even that can prevent the occurrence of a retinal detachment. This is a very important factor for how scleral buckling works. In scleral buckling, especially non-drainage surgery, we don't always oppose the retina. We just bring it close and then the vitreous is opposing, the flow of fluids changes and it attaches. So this is a very important fact for you to know that the intact vitreous gel will plug a retinal hole and prevent an occurrence of detachment. Now, the other importance of this is once you remove the vitreous, now you know you don't have anything to plug the hole. So now you have to create a tamponade with something else. So you understand the difference between a buckling surgery where the vitreous is there for plugging and where on the other hand, you have vitreoretinal surgery where you need to give a tamponade either with gas or oil or whatever you want. So this is the importance of this factor. Metabolic factors. Now, you know, you heard about non-drainage surgery. You, you attach, the fluid was still there. Next day, fluid was gone. So how does this happen? The RPE pump can pump fluid from the subretinal space to the choroid at a very high rate. And what is that high rate? 0 0.3 microliter per hour per millimeter square of RPE. So you say 0 0.3 microliter per hour. What is that? Nothing. No, it's not. It's 1,000 millimeter square of RP there, which translates into 300 microliter per hour or 5 microliters per minute. That is more than double the rate of aqueous drainage. So you understand how much fluid can be taken away from the retinal, subretinal space by an intact RP. I'm getting a whistling sound. I don't know why. Now we come to physical factors. Now we, I told you that the that the retina and uh, and RP are they are resistant to flow of water inside. So the small pressure difference, which is 0.5 into 10 to the power minus three millimeters of mercury, that's the pressure difference between the vitreous side and the uh, RP side, is enough to generate force sufficient to keep the retina fixed against the wall of the eye. So this is so this physical force is also there. And finally, you have the interphotoreceptor matrix. This is viscous material composed of proteins, glycoproteins, proteoglycans. This material stretches markedly before it breaks, so it keeps it stuck. The adhesion of this interphotoreceptor matrix to the RP and photoreceptors is due to specific receptors like fibronectin, integrin, maybe mannose, there's some studies which say yes, some which say no. And finally, dehydration of the subretinal space enhances these wide binding properties even further. Now, this is very important because what happens in a retinal break is that this interphotoreceptor matrix gets exposed, right? At this is a break, it will get exposed in this area. Once it gets exposed, it gets hydrated. Once it gets hydrated, detachment will occur. And that is also the basis of how Linkov's rules got formulated. We'll come to that later. Now, another fact that you need to remember 
after surgical repair of a retinal detachment, uh, the reattachment occurs promptly before the outer segments have actually regenerated and microvillous connections have been reestablished. So that's why there is time gap between retina attaching and final visual acuity being uh, achieved. This interdigitation of photoreceptor microvilli begins to develop within three days of retinal attachment, but does not return to normal till five to six weeks after the reapposition of an experimentally detached retina. So this is to explain to you why it takes time for the vision to come back, even though the retina has attached. Now, really, keeping the retina attached is a tug of war. There is the RP pump, the interphotoreceptor matrix, the intact retina. These are all preventing entry of fluid into the subretinal space. And then there is vitreous traction, which is pulling it off and trying to separate this retina from the RPE. Because of this, you can get a retinal detachment in three different ways. You can get a break in the retina. Now it's no longer watertight, so water will pass, fluid will go from the vitreous cavity into the subretinal space. You can get a traction detachment where the RP, the retina is physically stripped from the RP by overcoming the adhesive forces because there's a lot of traction within the vitreous. That's a traction detachment. And then you can actually have an exudative detachment where there's due to some factor, fluid is being pushed into the subretinal space from the RP. So can we differentiate these? Before we come to that, I'm going to talk about the clinical presentation symptoms of a rheumatogenous retinal detachment. The usual presentation is a diminution of vision, and this is sudden onset or sudden detection. Keep this possibility in mind. See, sudden onset is, I was seeing, I'm looking with both the eyes, suddenly say, hey, in this eye, I've suddenly started seeing less. That is sudden onset. Sudden detection is, I'm roaming around, I hit my eye, I, I close it, then I open, when I open it, I say, hey, I can't see through this. Now, is this something that happened just now because of trauma? Or is it something that was already present and I have now noticed it? The two have very different connotations. If I have noticed it now, it could be an old detachment. So you must take that history properly. And if that fits in with an old detachment, you must keep in mind, this could be a patient with a long-standing detachment. He's missed it. Maybe it was an amblyopic eye. Maybe it was an eye with less vision from the beginning. It detached. He didn't pick up. He picked it up only when something, some event occurred. Now you know, prognostically, this case is not very good. So this is the importance of this. <clears throat> what about the other symptoms? The most important are flashes or photopsia. This is basically a sign of mechanical stimulation of a photoreceptor. Now, what happens when that happens, when there's this mechanical stimulation? The patient either sees something like a spark of light or he sees something like lightning. This is to show you this. You'll have to look very carefully at this because the spark is very small. Look carefully. You see that? So if guy says, I just saw chingari eye, spark came. That is a sign, that is photopsia. Or he says, I saw something like lightning. That is photopsia. This is mechanical stimulation of the retina. Okay, but you have to differentiate this from what is a neurological flash. Now, this is important because a neurological flash is something that comes regularly lasts for some time has a focal area of either light or dark and maintains its relationship on eye movement and then it may be followed by a post ictal headache i'll show that later now the other important thing is floaters floaters just having one or two black spots is not a sign of an rd developing but if you get a sudden onset of floaters, or if you get a shower of floaters, these are a sign that a retinal break may have occurred or a posterior which is detachment may have occurred and uh, you can have a detachment in these cases. The third case feature is a field loss. If as a fellow says from one side, I can't see, 
that is a sign that there may be a detachment or he says i see a whale like sensation so floaters whale like sensation uh, flashes are usually signs of a red matter genus detachment and what do you see in uh, in those when what was i talking about this regular flash, uh, flashes look here so light came on off on off on off on off on off comes for some time and then goes away and follow following that patient says yes i was having some headache after that this is a sign of a neurological headache it's it's a, a, a in the visual pathways or in the occipital lobe there may be a focus needs to be investigated by a neurologist he needs to do an eeg he needs to do an mri and then check out whether there is a tendency to seizures now let's go ahead what are the other things you need to examine in a patient of detachment you need to look for visual acuity you expect the vision to be at least hand movements most of the times and the pr the projection of rays does not become inaccurate in most detachments except uh, i'm putting a rider if there's a giant retinal tear if it's a giant retinal tear which has gone off to the other side you could have an inaccurate pr but generally in a regmatogenous detachment the pr is accurate now from the point of view of when you are going to be doing surgery so you need to see other things like you need to see whether there's a trabeculectomy bleb it will help you to decide what kind of um conjunctival incision you will make or whether you decide not to do a buckle you decide to do a, a vitreo retinal surgery look for areas of scleral thinning you need to avoid these during surgery look for whether check up whether it's a recent cataract uh, surgery and if what is the integrity of that wound um even 15 days old wounds can sometimes open up when you open, are trying to do a buckle so you have to be careful you must check you may need to uh, to make the the strain on the wound they should look for that also look at the cornea rule out fuchs dystrophy sometimes if you going to make a, if you're going to make a patient a fake it you find you did, did a great detachment and then got a a, a, a cornea which had uh, decompensated you also want to rule out trauma because many very often detachments occur because of trauma so look at the angle to rule out angle recession especially if you suspect that this may be a traumatic regmatogenous detachment again look for sphincteric tears and isochoria cataract just specifically important if you're going to be doing a vr surgery will you be able to do it do you need to remove the cataract when you do the surgery if the patient is pseudophagic look at the posterior capsule integrity why because if there's a rent and if that rent is bigger than the size of the optic there is a good chance that when you are doing a uh, uh, air fluid exchange the air will come into the ac it will, uh, could affect your visualization the silicon oil come could come into the ac and compromise your surgery so you need to know about that if the patient is a fake you know you need to do an inferior pi in that patient so th these are other things to know and most importantly you need to note the intraocular pressure if it is low it's a sign that the patient is getting a choroidal detachment it can affect the prognosis you want to try to manage that also and sometimes you can have high intraocular pressure that occurs in a condition which is called schwarz matsuo syndrome and that usually gets cured after the control uh, the management of rd but you need to be sure that you don't end up uh, making the pressure go higher during the surgery now how do you differentiate we we had left this in the middle how do you differentiate an exudative detachment from a regmatogenous now a regmatogenous detachment can occur in any quadrant whereas an exudative detachment will start in the inferior quadrants and then a total rd is possible specifically because its gravitationally it goes down presence of a tear is the pathognomonic pathognomonic sign of a regmatogenous detachment once you got a tear you know you you dealing with a regmatogenous detachment you don't need to worry if there's no retinal break you have to make sure you're not dealing with an exudative detachment now i'll show you the pictures you'll see the retinal surface is corrugated it may have an epiretinal membrane may not have epiretinal membrane or subretinal membranes but the surface is a little corrugated in a regmatogenous detachment whereas it is smooth convex and bullous 
in a exudative divascularity. Shifting of fluid is rare in a, a, a rheumatogenous detachment, though it can happen in 5% of cases. It is a characteristic sign of, uh, of a exudative detachment. Now here, be careful when you're dealing with a rheumatogenous detachment and if the patient has shifting, you have to be very careful during, during a buckling procedure that it should not happen that you move the eye, the fluid goes to the other side and you do a drainage, finding you get a dry drainage and you incarcerate the retina. So you have to be careful if there's shifting, you have to manipulate the retina so that the fluid comes to the area where you're going to be doing the drainage. Just small, small tips I'm giving you in addition while we're doing this examination. A Schaffer sign, that means pigments in the retinal, retinal lentil space, space or behind the IOL are characteristic of a rheumatogenous detachment. These are basically RP clumps being released from the break and then they come into the vitreous. This is not like uh, going to happen in an exudative detachment. The other important thing about an exudative detachment, if you have a retinal detachment which comes up to the back of the lens, this is virtually pathognomonic of an exudative detachment. And if you can see a mass lesion, it is again a characteristic sign of an exudative detachment. Now you see the upper one, you see these corrugations. This is a bullous detachment, but it is a rheumatogenous detachment because of these corrugations. I know I don't even, even if I don't find a break, I know I'm dealing with a, uh, with a rheumatogenous detachment. If I find a break, I don't have a problem. This break is at the edge of a lattice. You see this lattice is there. There's one break here and there's another break at the horseshoe tear at this edge of the lattice. But this, again, though it's a bullous detachment, it is a smooth, bullous, dome-shaped detachment. And you can see these vascular anomalies in the periphery. This is a Coates disease. So this patient, and I'm not going to go into exudative detachment too much because I think you had a whole class just uh, four days back. Okay. Now, a traction detachment. Traction detachment, I told you, occurs because of pull. The pull can happen anywhere, but most often is at the posterior pole. In this case, there is no tear. The retinal surface behind the traction becomes concave, you know, because if you see, there's this epiretinal membrane, it pulls the entire retina. So this forms a concavity, another concavity over here, concavity here in between. And this, the important thing is a tractional detachment may or may not involve the aura. It's usually secondary to um, proliferative diabetic retinopathy or severe neovascularization due to Peel's disease or any other cause, which co any other situation which causes severe fibrovascular proliferation. The other thing to differentiate is a retinoschisis. Now, the important thing that we need to differentiate is a senile retinoschisis. A senile retinoschisis basically has a splitting at the uh, outer plexiform layer of the retina. It's so usually an incidental finding, but it can be bilateral in 85% per of cases. There are two types, the reticular and the typical. The typical is a shallow elevation of the inner uh, retinal layers, and it's usually pre-equatorial. The reticul uh, reticular is traditional bullous, much more bullous, but the inner layer is very thinned out. It's often like a beaten metal, like you see over here. It looks like a beaten metal appearance or with some kind of pits like here. With sometimes it can have minute glistening yellow white surface dots, which is not seen in this, with minimal alterations of the RP or atrophy. The other important thing is you can actually see these are large outer retinal holes, which have, these are more than three disc diameter. They are rolled up. You see, this is rolled up. And these kind of things usually happen in the reticular form. The subretinal fluid usually does not extend beyond the schisis. But for both these schises, you were not, you're not going to confuse the foveal retinal schisis from a retinal detachment usually. How do you differentiate it from a retinal detachment? Now, I told you retinal detachment is a full thickness separation of nine layers from RP. Retinoschisis is separation at the level of the outer plexiform layer or nerve fiber layer, which you cannot differentiate. Schaffer sign is present in a detachment, not present in a schisis. Detachment can occur in any quadrant, but schisis are usually in the inferotemporal quadrant. 
Sometimes in the supratemporal quadrant, other situations are rare. A detachment is grayish colored, opaque. Retinoschisis is almost transparent layer of separation. The undulating uh, folds or fixed folds can be seen in a detachment. Again, a retinoschisis also, as I showed you, just a smooth kind of taut elevation. But the most important things which differentiate a detachment from a schisis. In a detachment, if you indent, indent it, uh, do scleral indentation, the outer layer can be approximated towards the inner layer. But with a retinoschisis, you cannot approximate the two. You'll always see that there's a gap between the two. No laser burn is possible in a detachment, but if you give a, a test burn, a laser reaction will come in the outer layer. Relative field effect with progressive increase in its intensity is present in the uh, in a uh, regmatogenous detachment, whereas the retinoschisis has an absolute field effect. That whole area has a field effect. So this is how you can differentiate a detachment from a schisis. And this sometimes becomes an issue, especially when it's uh, taught, and then you don't know whether you want to operate this because retinoschisis will not be progressive. Detachment is progressive. You have to be very clear about what you're dealing with. Now, when you are looking for, for retinal breaks, what do you do? So, you know, the person who really uh, gave us a lot of information about how to detect a retinal break was Linkoff. And now one thing I want to tell you, why, how, what is the basis regarding this? The basis regarding this is again what I told you. The break, which is the, the flap, which is open, exposes the mucopolysaccharides. Fluids tends to go up. So fluid will always go to the aura first. The detachment, that's why the regmatogenous detachment always goes to the aura. And then from the, so it will go in circular fashion, down and down, and then come, go around the disc. So that is how this basis has been formed. So you can actually mentally figure out how uh, a particular break, when you see a detachment, you can figure out this is where the break should be. Now let's see how. Now you see, if you have a total detachment or a superior detachment that crosses the midline. So this crosses the midline. The primary hole is either at the 12 o'clock position or in a triangle, this triangle, which in which the apex is at the aura and the sides of which intersect the equator, one clock hour on either side of the 12 o'clock meridian. And this occurs 93% of times. So this is the kind of place you would expect this break to be. Now, if you have a, a superior nasal or a temporal detachment, the hole usually lies within 1.5 clock hours of the highest border, 98% of times. So you see, this is the highest border. This is less than 1.5. This is one. This is around three fourth of a clock hour. So this is within one clock hour. So up to here is where you would expect the break. These are the classic Linkov's rules, and this is the third classic Linkov rule. In an inferior detachment, the higher side indicates to which side of the disc an inferior hole lies 95% of the time. So again, this is the six o'clock meridian. This is the, the detachment is higher on this side. So this is where on the same side inferiorly is where you'll find the break. But you can also think of other things. If you have an inferior detachment, which is bullous, the chances are that the hole is above the horizon, horizontal meridian because it's gravitationally that the fluid comes down. Now, if you have now, this goes beyond the link of soul. I told you the initial four link of rules. But if you, we saw, if you have uh, a break, a uh, detachment higher on one side, that's the side where the uh, break will be. But what if it's equal on both sides? Chances are it's somewhere around six o'clock. If you have an inferior bullless detachment with equal bullet height on both sides, chances is there are track from superiorly somewhere around 12 o'clock, which is coming down, causing this bullet. So this is where you should be. So don't miss that. So this is how you can find out where your break is. And this is much more important if you're doing a scleral buckling. In a scleral buckling, your visualization before surgery your, is always better than your visualization during surgery. Keep this in mind. But when you're doing a vitreoretinal surgery, your visualization on the table is better than your visualization in the uh, pre-op period. So comparatively. 
So if you're thinking of doing a buckling, please, or considering buckling, please spend a lot of time to look for these breaks. The other important thing you need to look at is how much is the proliferative vitreo retinopathy because that will help you to decide what kind of surgery you want to do. The previous old classification had grade A, B, C, 1 to 4 and D, 1 to 3. A was Schaffer's sign, B was, which is just pigment in the vitreous, B is partial thickness, retinal fold seen as corrugation on the retinal surface, did not make difference to the prognosis. C1 to C4 was presence of star folds in 1 to uh, four quadrants and D1 to 3 was whether the disc is visualized or not visualized along with PVR. It's not just bullous detachment. It is star folds and all causing the uh, retina to go into uh, to stiff uh, folds and then uh, you're not able to see the disc. So if you can't see the disc at all, it's D3. If you can see a little bit of the disc, it's D2. And if you can see the disc, but there are star folds all over and, and in the central area, then that's D1. And the severity of the PVR affects the approach to prognosis management and prognosis. But then it was found that this is not good enough. So a new classification of proliferative vitreo retinopathy was, was then designed. And, and this uh, new classification is based on the clock hour of involvement and the location of the proliferative vitreo retinopathy. So you have anterior PVR, which could be circumferential. That means um, at the posterior which is faced, uh, uh, there, is, there is a circumferential constriction, which will cause an irregular retina fold or radial folds. If it's at the posterior which is faced, it's pulled up, then it becomes a perpendicular traction. And that causes a circum smooth circumferential fold at the posterior which is base insertion. And finally, you can have an anterior loop traction where a fold of the retina goes anteriorly. And in the middle, uh, anteriorly, there's a peripheral anterior retinal trough with stretching of the posterior stretching of the ciliary processes. Now, let me just diagrammatically show you. Now, look at this. Supposing this were the vitreous fibers at, uh, at the level of the posterior vitreous base and they constricted, what will happen? You will get this kind of a radial fold. So, this is the radial fold due to circumferential traction. Now look over here. Supposing at that same posterior vitreous base, it started pulling towards the center of the eye. The vitreous is there, forms membranes which pull into the center of the eye. You would get these kind of perpendicular traction. And finally, if you look at this, if you see the vitreous being, the retina being pulled anteriorly, now what will happen? A fold of the retina will be pulled anteriorly towards the aura. There'll be a trough in between and you're going to get a shortening of the retina. This kind of detachment will not settle with a buckle also. It will not settle till this, this traction is relieved or a retinectomy is done. So this is the worst form of traction. And of course, this is a star fold where there's a little, small little epidermal membrane in the middle and it pulls it. Uh, just to show you, um, let me see, I don't have a handkerchief or something here. I can show you. I can show you here. Look at this. This is this is a star fold being formed on my shirt. This is how it forms. Now let's go. Let's actually see within the eye. How does this happen? Now look carefully over here. This is the which is being cut. You see this? I'm going to stop it over here for a moment. Now you see what? This is the vitreous, which was there all over, a sheet of vitreous pulling at the posterior vitreous base. So where at the edge, it, what, what will it cause? It will cause perpendicular traction. Now look carefully ahead. We keep on eating it up and you see these folds will be there. Now you see we are eating it up. Now I'm going to stop again. Yeah, You see these? Now these are folds. These folds, radial folds will be because of circumferential traction. And finally, after you've done that, what do you find? You found that and you find you can't see the disc. We're coming to that now. We've just completed this anterior membrane we've removed. And after you remove that, you find that you can't see the disc. Can you see the disc? No, you can't. Now look carefully and we're trying to find out if there's a membrane which is pulling this in. And we found this, look at this. We've removed this membrane and 
it's covering the entire posterior pole, pulling it and not letting the disc ease. Now, after that was done, now I'm putting PFCL and you can see that this can be seen, the retina can be seen. So this is how you relieve all this. Now we are going to discuss this in two other classes, so I'm not going to discuss this. Now the second important thing is posterior PVR. Posterior PVR, you could have star folds like I showed you due to epiretinal membranes. You could have these becoming diffuse, like I showed you that large epiretinal membrane, which called irregular retinal folds in the posterior. Retina drew it down so that the disc could not be seen. Or you can get subretinal bands, which can be either a napkin ring that means if it is just next to the disc, it can close it up like a napkin ring or a closed line. If it's a straight line, if it's linear. Now, the important thing is subrendal bands are only removed if they are preventing the retina from settling. And I'm going to just show you one video. You see this here. This is a subretinal band. We put PFCL and after that, you see it was tenting. This retina was not going back. And so we decided to... Uh, make a retinotomy, small retinotomy, removing this membrane, removed it from one side, and then we pick it up from the other side. And it's out. And it, now the retina is settling up. So, so, you, so you don't remove this unless, so you could have a retinal, uh, subretinal band, but may not be affecting the, uh, <coughs> the retina uh, ability to settle back. Then you don't need to remove it. Now, what is the objective of our surgery? I'm not going to, going to discuss this in detail because you have two lectures on this. But basically, in a regmatogenous detachment, our objective is temporary closure of the retinal break. Mark my words. You only need to close it for a small period of time. The moment you close it, I told you the RP pump is so powerful, it will remove all the SRF from behind. Now, once you close it, but if you if you open it again, again the detachment will occur. So you need to create an adhesion between the RP and the inner nine layers by either laser or cryo. Only two things we have which we use as a routine diathermy long back, but not now. Uh, this allows the retina to stay settled permanently. Okay. The cryo or the uh, laser has closed the break. The RP pump takes away the fluid. Now, how can you do this? There are various ways to do this. You can either move the RPE forward, the buckle with a buckle. You can remove the traction which was causing the retina to move forward by vitreo retinal surgery. Or you can do a temporary tamponade of the break and do laser and cryo, which creates the adhesion. Later on, the, that tamponade goes away and your retina is set. So you can have something like this. You, initially, this is where it should have been. Now the retina came up to here. You with a buckle, you can come up, you can remove the vitreous, you can let it settle back, or you can have a tamponade. So tamponade principle is used in the pneumatic retinopexy. Shifting the principle, uh, the shifting position of the RP is used in a link of temporary balloon buckle, or in conventional scleral buckling, uh, either with drainage or non-drainage. And removal of the traction is by vitreoretinal surgery. Both simple like that. अभी बाकी डिटेल में एक घंटे का लेक्चर दो बार आपको मिलने वाला है नेक्स्ट टू सीरीज में टू टॉक मोर अबाउट हाउ दिस इज डन बट वन थिंग वाज नॉट मेंशन एंड आई थॉट अबाउट दैट वाज इंपॉर्टेंट कैन बी प्रिवेंट अ डिटैचमेंट फ्रॉम ऑपरेटिंग सो इज इट पॉसिबल देयर कैन बी प्रोफिलैक्सिस फॉर समथिंग इफ आई चेक आउट व्हेन द पेशेंट डजंट हैव अ डिटैचमेंट सो प्रोफिलैक्सिस हैज बीन इंडिकेटेड फॉर लैटिसिस होल्स होल्स विद ओपरकुलम horse shooters but when when or when in these conditions is prophylaxis really indicated because there's a lot of controversy on this also the first thing is if a patient is symptomatic that means acute onset of symptoms not patient says mere ko char floaters dikh rahe hain pichle 2 saal se that's not symptomatic patient comes to you you find that he and he says i've started seeing flashes like lightning or the sparking and for the last few days or he says i suddenly saw a shower of floaters yesterday or i've suddenly seen this black round ring which has suddenly come last two three days this is some symptomatic patient flashes and acute onset of floaters is an indication for treatment but other indications include a fellow eye of a patient of a detachment or a patient with a family history of detachment and in this be careful so far we used to talk of 
ऑफ द पेरेंट्स हैविंग अ डिटैचमेंट एंड वी यूज्ड टू आस्क बच्चों को चेक कर लेते हैं नाउ आई हैव सीन द रिवर्स हैपनिंग अ 20 ईयर ओल्ड गाय कम्स टू यू और एन 18 ईयर ओल्ड गाय कम्स टू यू एंड ही हैज अ डिटैचमेंट एंड यू से हे व्हाट अबाउट योर फैमिली चेक दैट द पेरेंट्स आल्सो समटाइम्स कैन बी रिवर्स other risk factors include a myopia of 6 to 10 diopters pres definite presence of traction which is specifically if there's a horseshoe tear holes with surrounding rim of fluid if it's just an isolate one is not uh, not much traction but if it is increasing or if it's a significant size i would prefer to still do prophylaxis for that now more important if you have an equatorial or more posterior location of a lesion or a perivascular lesion you should consider treating uh, doing prophylaxis now why now remember when a posterior vitreous detachment occurs where is that hinge of the posterior vitreous detachment at the posterior vitreous base near the ora now if you have lesions which are near the ora obviously by pushing at a hinge you can't open a door no so by there can't be much pull if the lesion as is at the ora so a pre equatorial lesion is not such a big risk but what if it is equatorial or pre or post equatorial it's a huge amount of pull and those eyes are more likely to um, develop a detachment so i would consider doing uh, prophylaxis in those cases too so ladies and gentlemen early detection optimum management and optimum examination are the keys to optimizing op outcomes in patients with retinal detachment and if you and it's a very rewarding surgery it's one surgery where you can say you actually help the patient who was going to go blind from going blind and that is an irreversible blindness if the detachment is more than a year or, or so old so um, please give time to retinal examination give time to differentiating uh, retinoschisis from a detachment so that you don't do unnecessary surgery also give time to detecting the breaks and then uh, you will be told the principles of surgery uh, further we have only discussed a, a little bit of the principles just a bird shot a bird's eye view and you'll see the details uh, over uh, the next two lectures and hopefully you will be contributing to a lot of your patients getting vision thank you very much ladies and gentlemen and this incidentally uh, this is the group which uh, uh, lalit was talking about dr dr uh, tiwari was our mentor uh, just like we've been mentor to mentors to others and the two of us have been together for donkeys years now but under the tutelage of our uh, mentor dr tiwari and finally many many years now two decades back dr avinder gupta joined us and this this was our group we stand together in uh, in most of our works and we help each other whenever we are in doubt and remember there are situations where you will be in doubt despite everything and when you are in doubt don't hesitate to take opinion from somebody else who works with you and who is a colleague thank you very much and thank you uh, lalit for allowing me to present thank you dt for uh... this uh, wonderful intro a basic lecture into a very common disease uh, with the retina people at least detachment uh, can we put off the screen so i think uh, dt has very rightly emphasized that detachment is a sign of urgency because early treatment will happen only if you diagnose early and uh, believe me today if you treat early lot of these patients lot of these patients recover normal 6 by 6 vision and it remains there for life long but if you don't diagnose and don't treat them early believe me these patients are condemned to blindness forever so that is the point in retina that you have to be very very suspicious of uh, you know signs and symptoms whenever they occur and what he rightly said was anything suddenly happening sudden onset of flashes and photos this is important rather than you see uh, having two three floaters which are there for long long time you see when we ask history of a patient so he says uh, you know it's a very common complaint uh, in our opd teen char dhabbe dikh rahe hain 
अरे धब्बे सिंस वेन धब्बे सिंस फोर इयर्स ओकेजनल धब्बा सो दैट इज एट दैट टाइम माई यू नो आई डोंट गेट अलार्म बट इट पेशेंट से स्टिल ये स्टेड एज ओके एंड सर्वी आई हैड अज नंबर ऑफ शॉर ऑफ लोटर्स एंड दिस स्पार्क लाइक ही शोर ए स्मॉल वीडियो एंड परसिस्टेंट स्पार्क एंड रेगुलरली कमिंग इन वन डायरेक्शन दैट विल रेज माई टेंटिकल्स टू रूल आउट ए ट्रैक्शन ब्रेक इज सच पेशेंट सो इट इज वेरी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट इवन इफ यू कैंट सी ए ब्रेक एंड सपोज पेशेंट स्टिल सिम्टोमेटिक ask him to come some other time also and you such patients can't be left sometimes you will miss a break also uh, so uh, add to that lalit see uh, yeah, yeah, sure. acute pvd is a uh, dynamic condition and yeah. takes 2 3 months to complete so you on your first visit even if you find don't find a break the patient must be seen very regularly because he may develop a break during follow up so you you know I, my protocol normally is first after one week then two weeks then four weeks then six weeks so that ensures you don't miss a break and if he and you also tell him if the symptoms increase come back because yeah. it's possible something may be developing so, so never are- never never ignore a patient who has sudden sort of flash of floaters especially in a myopic eye especially in an eye who has been operated for cataract surgery especially who has had trauma to his eyes and especially if they are of acute onset so these couple of conditions even if you die like dt was saying even if you don't find a break it could be a evolving uh, you know pvd and you may you know discover break later on so these patients you know have to be under regular follow up and everybody has his own protocol when to call for follow up so any questions we have uh, let's have this uh, you know hot seat question first and then we can have some discussion so there are a couple of questions which i i can see in the chat box uh, one is that how much old rd has a poor prognosis Did no, I said that actually? Like, yeah. Uh, an RD which is more than one year old is normally considered as not to be operated. But the longer the period beyond three months, the visual prognosis would be uh, relatively poor. And by one year, that prognosis is more or less close to nil. So old RD has to be qualified whether it's a macular artery. Sometimes you will find an inferior artery which is old with demarcation line or macular is spare. so such patients may do pretty okay with the buckling procedure or a dialysis i sometimes there are incidental discoveries also you see an inferior detachment which may be lying for months and years and sometimes uh, they will form demarcation lines or a autocorrelate nitis may form pigmentation may form which does not allow it to progress and vitreous gel is you know solid in those and they may you know plug the temporarily the hole so such patient may have a reasonably good prognosis till the time macula is not involved Yes. So what did you see? Because the macula is involved, like he showed a beautiful video where all these things were, you know, like uh, folded upon itself, and this could not be seen. Something like PVR D three, where he peeled off a membrane from the from the surface of the disc and then flattened it with the help of PFCL. So old RDs which involve the macula and generally, or if they have PR inaccurate with coral attachment, they have poorer kind of visual prognosis. Another question which is there, uh, Dinesh, is senile retinoschisis. uh let me see snail retinoschisis uh has does it have any predisposing factors is there any no any it predisposing no it doesn't but but foveal retinoschisis and hereditary is hereditary and that no. is it like and foveal retinoschisis can be uh, associated with a peripheral retinoschisis yeah foveal if you have peripheral, if you have peripheral and foveal retinoschisis that is a hereditary retinoschisis yeah that's a excellent condition you know for will biology is excellent condition but this doesn't have a predisposition it's an incidental right. finding when it's wrong yeah correct and the but i can tell you one situation which i have seen in patients who have uh, um, fevr mm-hmm. or in yeah. patients they can sometimes have peripheral traction where they develop a retinoschisis or patients who got um, uh, rop and who have an anomalous kind of vitreous traction in the periphery sometimes they develop a, a, a retinoschisis you have to be very careful in those cases you don't be in a hurry to try to do any prophylactic uh, laser you will precipitate a break so, so another is- question uh, which in fact was the first question when we were lecturing how do you depict on a on a ampular or depict on a diagram retinoschisis yeah, it's actually as a there's an entire uh, Chart which I noted down. Like if you yeah. want, I can put it down for them. Uh, it's available uh, 
So maybe, uh, you know, if you can trace that chart, we would yeah. like to show that chart. We can send that. Maybe next time you can show that. So, but Retina Shais is a thinned out retina, believe me. Yeah. So what uh, Dr. Bem wants to know, how do you depict on a diagram? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. The depiction on a diagram I'm talking about. Yeah. On the retina diagram. Um, okay, let's take some other question meanwhile. Is lattice degeneration and snail trap degeneration the same thing? Yeah. That's so, uh, Dr. Soini, by and large, uh, the lattice and snail track is a similar kind of thinning of uh, retinal layers with the lattice generally has more crisscross pattern, whereas snail track may typically may not have. And lattice yeah, typically is, cigar, is a cigar shaped kind of lesion, but, uh, but snail track is synonymously used. So, other thing is uh, one question for you, DT, is how does subretinal bands form? He showed a very good video of subretinal bands. Yeah, subretinal bands are again, you see, uh, the RPE cells are basically, um, they undergo metaplasia. And, and that's where the fibrocytes come. And if, they, if it's been a long standing old RD, uh, these convert into, um, um, into uh, subretinal bands. These are actually fibrous bands only. And this is basically from the RPE, which is being showered, showers of which are going in the subretinal space. So you see all this band formation, membrane formation, whether they form in front of the nuisance retina or in between the space RPE and the nuisance retina depends. You see, once, once there is a break formation, if a lot of these um, uh, metaplastic RPE cells in the subretinal space and there is a, enough time or months elapse, then these uh, RPE cells undergo metaplasia and become fibrocytes, uh, sites. And then that is a tendency to form membranes and bands. If they are in front of the retina, they will cause even PVR, epithelial membrane formation, and pull on the retina. So it depends where do these metaplastic, potential metaplastic RPE cells settle down. If predominantly RPE uh, in between, then they will form separate mem membranes. And, and, uh, and if in front, they will form epithelial membranes and pucker and all these things. Other question, DT, which has uh, just come up is, commonly we see demarcation lines in temporal coordinate in myopes. Is it significant? Commonly we see demarcation line. I didn't get yeah, the see, demarcation oh. line tells you normally it will yeah. happen in yeah. inferior detachments. Yeah. Basically it tells you that the patient has had a, this is a long standing uh, detachment, but as Lalit told you, it is possible that the long standing detachment was inferior and the macula may be recently involved. In that case, the prognosis is not bad, but if it is, if you have, for example, if you see a demarcation line, which has gone, uh, above the macula in a layer above them, you know that this is a very old detachment. There the prognosis will be much worse. But basically demarcation lines are again, they tell you places where the detachment stayed at that level for some time and then progress to the next level, then forms the next demarcation line, then progress to the next level. So the multiple demarcation lines are actually signs of where all it progressed at which till which level it came. Yeah, demarcation lines are generally again a pigmented kind of lines and generally seen in inferior detachments because of uh, chronicity. And they're like DT said, there are multiple demarcation lines means the aging or, or the age of the detachment. Next question uh, for you is, you see, sometimes you see these WWP areas in my view, how significant they are. White without pressure. Yeah, and so white. white without pressure is not of so much significance as a routine, but in patients who had a giant retinal tear, the fellow eye, the white without air pressure areas are uh, uh, should be considered with suspicion. We can develop a detachment, um, a tear from there also. So normally, Sohini, uh, in uh, in a routine patient, if you see white without pressure, do not do not uh, alarm the patient unnecessarily, and do not never treat these patients at all. Only in one condition, fellow of a GRT, and if you have white without pressure, white with pressure is different. Yeah. White without pressure then these areas may be kept under watch because these areas in a fellow FGRT are known to develop uh, tears. So uh, any other question we have? Uh, 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 so on the other channels, we have like one question is how to manage silicon oil globules in AC post-surgery, especially when IOP rises with it. Yeah, I think uh, so surgical aspect DT didn't cover, but I think he'll love to answer this question. What's the question? Sorry. Silicon oil bubble in the anterior chamber. 
with rise of oh, pressure if it comes okay see now first thing is uh, you know i i told you that when you do your pre op work up you should see is the size of the posterior uh, capsular rent smaller than the optic or bigger than the optic if it is smaller than the optic then um, it will usually not come forward if it is bigger than the optic there is a good tendency for it to come forward and there are two three ways of managing it for preventing it from coming forward one easy way is to do a direct silicon oil uh, fluid exchange that will take care of this because silicon oil has greater uh, has a, a greater viscosity it sticks together also it doesn't flow easily into the and it has some surface tension also it has less surface tension but more viscosity it, if you don't let the pressure rise it, a direct exchange will uh, not let silicon oil come easily into the ac the second thing that you can do you can put a little bit of uh, viscoelastic at the edges of the uh, point where you think uh, you know where the uh, pcf yeah, ending in the ac that will also prevent it and a third thing can be supposing chalo you don't want to do any of these these are uh, um, two easy ways the third way is that okay you do the air fluid exchange air will come into the ac once the air comes into the ac this air will also come into the vitreous cavity uh, will also the silicon oil will also come into the ac so now what you do is when you've done when you're doing the silicon oil uh, when you're injecting the silicon oil get uh, when you are something like uh, um, a little below the level of the iul you stop don't put more silicon oil and remove the uh, re remove the uh, air now you've got air in the ac you've got silicon oil behind but it's under low pressure so it's not yet high enough to come into the ac now you remove the oil, the air from the uh, ac and re re uh, replace it with fluid and now gent don't inject too much silicon oil do a little underfill you may still get away with it but this is the trickiest way to do it the other two are easier to do the third last thing is you've done everything and it's come into the ac now what do you do now if it's come into the ac and it's at the time of the table you're on the table you still open one port keep one port there keep it open inject visco into the ac fill it the uh, silicon oil which is in the ac will now come forward and the pressure will not build up because the if the pressure is building oh, up the good. excess will come out from the port okay. yeah don't let the pressure build up because you the next thing will be even the visco will go down and that will also cause more reaction so don't let the pressure build up inject slowly now you've got visco in the ac there is no silicon oil there bring the pressure down keep the pressure low once the pressure is low do a gentle wash of the visco if you remove all the visco the silicon oil will come back but if it is totally filled with visco the pressure will rise too much so what you need to do is you you want a little bit of this visco to come out so what you do is make sure that the 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 port is open so the visco uh, so any pressure no pressure rise is happening inject a little bit of fluid and let a part of the visco escape out so that now you have visco mixed with fluid uh, in the ac now close up there will be some reaction in the post op period which will go away in a week on the table you can give higher dose of uh, systemic steroids yeah. and during the post op period give higher steroids it will settle down so this so you have to wait two things now you will not get a regrets you see there are instances even even without pcr even with fakey kai sometimes this may happen Yeah. you see because of zonular compromise or whatever it is it may sometimes still come so the question what dinesh four five things just told is a prophylaxis of management of that silicon should not come but if it does come into a dh chamber in the post op period and pressure is high so what should we do you see what i would do is in such situation where you know post op silicon bubble has come and pressure is high so if the pressure is manageable by few drugs and sufficient time has elapsed suppose only few days have elapsed then i may wait for a week or 10 days and if the pressure is controllable you see both the things have to happen if the pressure is way beyond let's say 30s then i will have to interview there's no issue about that but if the pressure is controlled by one or two drugs i will wait for one or two weeks because like dt said in uh, first few slides the addition has to form 
So believe me, this addition of break and RP generally forms within a gap of around 10 to 14 days. And then I may go in and, you know, uh, remove the oil also. But if the sufficient time has not elapsed and pressure is also not controllable, then you have to go and do okay. a revision surgery, considering these four or five things which it is already told. One more thing may I add, uh, Lalit. Yeah. So, you know, when you now, this I talked about on the table. Now, post of yes. what we were talking about, if silicon oil bubble is in the AC post op if there is a rim of fluid around it, mm -hmm. the pressure will not rise. No. It doesn't block the AC. Okay. So it's only a visual handicap for the patient because he can't see as well. It acts like a high myopic lens. But from the pressure wise, you don't have to worry and you can give the time you need for the adhesion to mm -hmm. form and you can remove it comfortably in, in that time. When the silicon oil fills the entire chamber, and remember, this is a difficult thing to recognize because when it fills the anterior chamber, the only way to recognize it is by a sheen at the level of the iris. Please be very careful. Most patients, most people will miss this because they will think this, this is a normal uh, AC. Actually, this AC is absolutely full of silicon oil and the pressure is high. In this situation, you will have to remove the oil. Now, and to remove the oil, the technique which I just told you, make one port, uh, one pass blown up of a port, and at the limbus, make an entry, inject the visco, let the silicone oil come out, make sure the pressure doesn't rise, and then leave a little bit of visco. Take care of uh, the pressure will settle down, and the oil won't come back again. So it is very important to recognize because it's, I'm telling you, uh, all of us have missed this uh, in our early days that if the oil is filling the entire chamber, sometimes you miss it also. And pressure is very high. So you have to have a, that sheen reflex which is coming. That's very, very significant. So any other questions? Uh, because we are running and out of time. about the silicon oil that sometimes goes subconjunctively. Should it be drained? It, you can away. remove it when you remove the silicon oil. Whenever you are doing silicon oil removal, you can make nicks, uh, you know, multiple nicks sometimes. Or one nick, it may, it will come it'll out. Come out. It, it will come out. It will come out. If it's too much. But remember, if that is happening to you too many times, it means your wound is open. You're yeah. leaving your wound open. Yeah. And that people, you know, people have a leaking. tendency to leave the wound open. Ki nahi, apne aap close ho hai. It's so a lot of times you see, once you do a small gaze surgery, and you see what we sometimes insist is, even at the cost of, you know, mild irritation, you should close it uh, with a suture. Some people, you know, even may compromise those, so there may be continuous leak from there, and there may be multiple bubbles in the surveillance space. So, but believe me, they will, uh, you know, they are easily amenable to surgery or maybe small nick once you are doing a SOR. So, any other question, Shefali or? or? Uh, sir, can you explain the various sizes of bands available and when to use which band buckle surgery? Any rule to follow? So, yeah. See, actually, frankly speaking, we've been using only the 240. There are people who use the 40, which is bigger. But as a routine, we only use, I, I have been only using the 240 band, which is a 2.5 millimeter band and uh, a 7 millimeter buckle, which is either 276 or 277. Um, that means either it's symmetric or it's asymmetric. The asymmetric, you push so that more part, it, go, uh, it, it indents more posteriorly. So as a rule, I put the asymmetric buckle, um, use it. Uh, or a symmetric buckle, either way, but basically a seven millimeter buckle uh, that gives adequate height for both for buckling procedures as well as for um, vitreoretinal surgery and uh, um, a, a 240 band for uh, if you want to put an inserting band. I don't Which use uh, the other. Uh, is world over, the commonest band, band means encircling band, which is used is 240. Some people may use, uh, you know, 40. Otherwise, but 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 the but the indent of the band is determined not by the width. We normally, we have 2.5 and have a separation suture of around say five millimeter suture. But it is the distance between sutures ultimately which determine the the uh, you know the ultimate indent. So therefore, most commonly world over, if you see all the vitreous surgeons, band which is there is 240, and the buckle commonest use is seven millimeter. We generally, we generally use a symmetric one, but asymmetric also is, uh, you know, used. Just, just to give you an idea, seven millimeter band, band, a seven millimeter buckle means you'll put the sutures normally one and a half times the distance. That is 10 millimeters. 10 millimeters. Now your anterior suture is usually at the aura, aura. 
and that is eight millimeters approximately. So a ten millimeter distance between the sutures means you've gone up to eighteen millimeters. Yeah. Right. So you've gone that, up. To that 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 generally is sufficient to. That is you know, sufficient. The entire, okay. Most uh, of your breaks occur fifteen, fourteen, or fifteen millimeters from the limbus around the equator. So that is why it is sufficient for most. If you want to go more posteriorly, you basically use the same ten millimeter distance. But instead of having your anterior suture at the ora, you go two millimeters posterior. Now your now your posterior suture can go at twenty millimeters. But I do not like in today's world. If I have to go beyond eighteen millimeters, I prefer to do a vitreo retinal surgery. I will for posterior breaks. I prefer to do a vitreo retinal surgery. Otherwise, there's too much of distortion. Yeah, you see, I agree because if you have to go beyond uh, say eighteen millimeter. Too much of manipulation, too much of pull of the muscles, and too much of an isometria we induce, and that is uncomfortable. So it's easier to go inside because those breaks that you are trying to indent with the elbow buckle, they are posterior, and those are very easily you know manageable by a VR surgery. Now and keep in mind one more thing: if you make this ten into twelve, that instead of ten millimeters, let me put it at twelve millimeters. All that happens is that the depth, the height of the buckle increases, not the amount of buckling. Yeah, so yeah. basically what happens is your break will now instead of falling on the summit of the buckle it will fall on the posterior slope and your surgery will fail so that one and a half times distance has to be always maintained so in any case surgical principles will be covered but uh, what the purpose of today's talk you asked talk, i thought you yeah. know from in test no, but, uh, but yeah yeah correct other questions you have any one I last question you can take We have covered, I think, all the questions. But I think uh, hats off to DT uh, for covering this uh, so-called, uh, you know, uh, principles of uh, occurrence of RD. You see, some things I think uh, there should be some take home, like uh, like uh, one line I read, five microliters per minute, which is the which is the RP pump flow rate, and which is he said twice the rate of aqueous drainage, which I think uh, is a is a is a figure to remember. I will also remember this figure, five microliters per minute. and such is the power of rp e pump which keeps uh, one of the factor uh, you know in attachment of the normal retina and the other thing which he emphasized i think uh, uh, rightly was how to differentiate this and very important thing he covered uh, about the prophylaxis of detachment and uh, the surgical principles and the surgical techniques i think uh, we will be covering later on but uh, but uh, this uh, why does rd occur and uh, and uh, what are the factors responsible for normal adhesion of this and like i said in the last lecture also rd is a misnomer it's primarily a separation it's a separation of uh, nine layers vis a vis because embryologically one is inner uh, uh, wall of the optical vesicle one is the outer so embryologically they are different so the detachment is actually a misnomer it's primarily separation of nine layers from the rde uh i think you very nicely covered about uh, detachment shises how to differentiate laser burns and prophylaxis and last uh, two slides were very very important for our, for every surgeon for every ophthalmologist in fact that detachment is a semi emergency kind of thing once we see a fresh detachment we try to operate within few days we don't allow this patient to you know uh, you know ask him to come and give a date of for surgery especially if it's a fresh rd especially if this is a macular spared rd such patient should be you know counseled in such a way so a lot of these patient today also i saw a patient is dr sub i will tell you after a week and no you have to get it done as early as possible otherwise the visual results may suffer so i think uh, with these yes, uh, i think we can add to that macular detachment if you have maximum period you allow a macular detachment is 7 days yeah. beyond 7 days the prognosis gets worse visual prognosis will get compromised by line so the first level is macular not involved you don't want it to get involved it has got involved you want it to be done within a week and if it's beyond a week then after that week to a month is more or less the same prognosis so counseling a patient of but, but of course you don't want to deliberately uh, increase from two week from week to four weeks uh, it just means that then the difference becomes less as the duration increases the difference in prognosis becomes less so it's a semi emergency kind of procedure and should be taken on board i think with these words uh, once again we thank dt for clarifying as i said lot of things about uh, detachment and lot of uh, you know uh, points he has raised 
about uh, principles of occurrence as well as principle of management of detachment. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, sir. I think I also want to thank Dr. Dinesh for this excellent, especially those small videos, which were a real nice tutorial of the flashes and the folds on the cloth to show the retinal folds that were really nice. And also, pun intended, the red slides really kept our eyes attached to the screen. <laughs> thank you so much. Next, we have um, on, on May 13th, retinal reattachment, general surgical principles, fetal buckling, and pneumatic retinopexy by Dr. Lingam Gopal. See you all then. Thank so you thank you, Dinesh, once again. And thank you, Santosh, and the entire team of iFocus uh, for this uh, arranging this wonderful talk uh, by, by a wonderful human being, DT. Thank Thanks you. a lot. Bye-bye.